everybody, welcome to the Voices of History YouTube channel. I am the creator of this channel. I'm the producer of the documentary series, Lest They Be Forgotten. For the last 20 years, I've traveled over a half million miles across North America, interviewing over 1,000 veterans from World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Gulf War. Men and women, a very diverse group of vet veterans. And I'm happy and proud of my documentary series and my veterans. And I've been happy to share these videos with you on YouTube. I do not monetize my videos, and that means there's no commercials, you'll never see a commercial on my video, but I want to take just a moment to say that I'm, I'm continuing my work, and I would ask for your help as I continue. I'm in the process of doing another vid video on uh, Vietnam, my second Vietnam film, Vietnam Remembered Part 2. I've done films on World War II, the Korean War, the Holocaust, 9-11 and even with law enforcement veterans. So I, I continue my work and it's important to record the history before it's lost. And I've lost many of my veterans over the years and it's been bittersweet for me, but the stories continue, the voices of history continue. So I'm asking you to help me with a donation to help continue this work that I'm doing, bringing you these stories. If you've been blessed, if you've been touched, if you're a new subscriber to this channel, thank you. And all my old subscribers, thank you. And thank you for those of you who have supported my my, my ministry of, of working with our veterans and, and bringing you these stories, these firsthand accounts of what it was like to be 18, 19 years old, landing on a beach under enemy fire in World War II, jumping out of a helicopter in Vietnam or in the frozen chosen reservoir in Korea. And I'm just thankful for all my veterans. I love my veterans. I take ownership in my work and I'm asking you to take ownership now in what I'm doing with the donation. There's information about donating in the video description. So underneath the video, click on the link that says donate. It's very easy through PayPal, and I would appreciate your help in this. And this, I don't do this all the time, um, but I need to ask for some help right now as I continue to go forth. I have many more stories I want to bring you, and I want to reach many more people. So God bless you. Thank you for your help, and I'm happy to bring you Vietnam Remembered, Part 2. I saw guys die that have never, they never had a chance to get married. They never had, some of them never even really had a steady girlfriend. Well, your kids are 18 years old. They never, they didn't know nothing from nothing. You know, some of them, I met them from all over, out of Chicago, off the streets of Chicago, tough kids. I met kids off the farm that didn't, that didn't, they were so naive, they didn't know nothing from nothing. And guys from every walk of life that you can imagine, the army gave them more clothes than they ever owned in their life. I've seen them all, I've been around them all, and the worst thing about it in Vietnam is after you've been there for several months and you survived, <clears throat> young, young and new guys come in, and you don't want to hardly know their names because you don't know if they're gonna make it or not and you don't want to get too attached to them. Guys die and, and uh, they're killed and, and after the, the battles are over, you come back and we shine their boots and, and uh, we, we have a 21 gun salute for them and, you know, but they're gone, man. And guess what? There's a Western Union gonna go to their mom and dad's house and says, your little Johnny was killed day before yesterday or whatever in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, that's a tough thing. All the guys, hopes, dreams, everything else is gone in an instant and it's over. think about home all the time. You think about how nice it would be to, to go back home. You have to understand for a lot of guys, for a lot of guys, six or seven months earlier, they were at their senior prom. You know, they went to, they got drafted, they went to basic training for eight weeks and then AIT for eight weeks and they were in NOM. If you knew a guy that was 22 or 23, we called him Pops. 
we were all 18 or 19, almost all of us. And here all of a sudden they are in, in a place where people are trying to kill them. And they're seeing people get killed. And they're having to kill people. And there's something about it when you have to kill a man. It is up close and personal. And the firefight's on, and it's whoever, whoever has the best, uh, can, uh, can get the most firepower out the fastest, that's who wins. And guys are gonna get hit. You hear guys screaming, guys are getting hit. Battlefields are real noisy places. And they, guys are getting shot, guys are getting, you know, grenades are being thrown back and forth. On a battlefield, yeah, you hear them call for mama and God almost always. And they call for their mama because I think for some guys that's the closest attachment, you know. They're dying, you know. They've got moments, seconds to live. And you're trying to do all you can for them. Words are meaningless, you know, when your body's torn to shreds, you know. Bullets from an AK-47 or something, I mean, it'll just absolutely tear you to pieces. And, uh, you know, I mean, battlefields and, and combat, you know, is brutal. It's all about life right then. Life, all of a sudden, at 19, you realize that you are not invincible, that you can die because you're seeing guys die. And all of a sudden, you realize that how precious life really is. lost uh, about 280 guys and three or 400 probably wounded somewhere in that neighborhood. But we lost about 200. We, we lost about 280 guys. And uh, that part's always difficult to talk about. Losing your buddies was uh, something that was uh, extremely difficult. Uh, I still see their faces today. I still have nightmares about about them. Uh, and uh, so that's some of the help that the uh, veterans hospitals try to give, you know, and the, they try to give us help, you know, as far as getting beyond that. You, you never will. You know, once you're wired for that, I mean, it's it, it's there forever. And you're, you know, you, you become, uh, you, you lose buddies. They go on missions with you and you lose them and there's nothing you can do. The problem of it is you don't have time to stay and grieve them. And you lose them, and, but the mission comes first. Doesn't matter how many guys are left. If it's down to the last guy, the mission has to be completed. Every mission that you have is, uh, is a contact mission. You know, the mission is to find the enemy and kill the enemy. That's the mission. Uh, you don't have any other missions. It's, you know, find the enemy, make contact, destroy the enemy. That's the mission. All combat soldiers has helped, helped, uh, uh, helped their buddies that's gone down. Either you know if they're wounded, uh, you're down there trying to help them too. You know, uh, sometimes you know a guy gets shot two or three times, or he's got shrapnel all over in him. Uh, uh, it's not like, kind of like in the movies. It's really not like the movies. You know, it's guys get blown to pieces, and uh, uh, you know, pieces and parts of people all over the place. And I've been in some fights where. You know, afterward you'd walk around and I literally picked one of my buddy's boots up and still had his foot in it. And, uh, you know, you, you put that in, in a body bag and, you know, grave register goes to grave registration, you know, you tag it and tag it and bag them, you know, and away they go. You're never going to be the same again. And at 19 years old, when you come out of Vietnam, you don't feel 19, you feel 40. Yeah, it changes you forever. And there's things that's going to stick with you that uh, that's going to be there forever. I, I read a book one time, it was called Once a Warrior Wired for Life. And it does, it wires you for life. I've seen guys do acts of bravery in, in combat that cost them their life. 
They didn't specifically do it for America. They did it for their buddies. You're not thinking about Betsy Ross and all that, but you're thinking about those buddies right there that we could absolutely trust with our life. We truly could trust them with our life. And we counted on them uh, every day. And they counted on, we counted on each other. And life is, is so precious in that aspect. And on some missions, before some missions, like Operation Cedar Falls and Junction City, they had priests come out and they prayed for us and gave us the last rites and all that, you know. And, and uh, Copa Mea, Copa Mea, Mox and Copa Mea, good luck to you, you know, may God go with you. And uh, away you go. It's the last thing on earth that I want to see is a war ever because I've been in one. I know what it's like. I know what it's like day in and day out. When I went to the Iron Triangle, I stayed in there for three months without coming out. No change of clothes, no hot food, no shower, no nothing. Stayed in the bush and just get, stay in there and just keep getting missions over and over and over. And they're always the same thing, you know, search and destroy, search and destroy, make contact with the enemy, you know, hold contact, make contact, make contact, destroy. Last day in Vietnam, that was a great day. Uh, actually, I didn't know I was going home. Uh, uh, really, I, I, I didn't have any idea. I wasn't even thinking about getting to go home yet. And <clears throat> I knew that I was getting short as time. I mean, you, you, they only made you do a year. And, uh, this lieutenant, who is, became a, real, uh, a pretty good friend of mine, just walked over and said, there's going to be a helicopter here in about 10 minutes. You're going to be on it. I said, what do you mean? And he said, you're going home. And I mean, it was just like going home. I'm going home. I mean, it stunned me for a minute. You know, I mean, just like took me by surprise because I'm in the combat mode. You know, I'm not in the going home mode. And uh, I was trying to shake it off, you know. They flew me over to, uh, uh, to Chu Lai, got on a C-130, flew me south to Tonsonude Air Force Base got on an airplane, a civilian airliner, uh, they had civilian airliners there, and got on a civilian airliner, and uh, no guns or nothing, but I'm still in my jungle uniform, and still got mud on my boots, and uh, away we go. We take off and we fly in the air. We get to Japan, take on fuel, and head for the States. They flew us into Travis Air Force Base, Vacaville, California. And we're coming into Travis, and, and it was at night, and I could see, begin to see the coastline. And I was looking out the window, and for the first time in a long time, I could see red, orange, blue. You have no idea what that's like. All I've been seeing is green. There are no colors in the jungle. Men don't have red on them. They don't have blue on them because, or white on them, or anything else that are those colors because it gives your position away. It's just, you become a target. Anyway, I'm looking at the coastline and it was so wonderful to see all those bright colors again. And we land and I'm putting my feet back on American soil. I'm back home. 